All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for adopting, bonding, and caring for a cat with cat whisperer Rachel Geller. So are you ready to welcome a furry friend into your life? Join Dr. Rachel Geller, an advisory board member of Cat Companions and an international cat behaviorist for this special presentation. Whether you're a first time cat owner or looking to expand your feline family, this event is perfect for you. Uh, that's the best I can do for perfect. Uh, so Rachel will uh, discuss choosing the right cat, creating a safe and welcoming environment, and building a strong bond with your new companion. Uh, Rachel is a certified cat behavior and retention specialist through the Humane Society, and she's a certified humane education specialist through the Academy of Pro-Social Learning. She is also the author of Saving the World, One Cat at a Time. Uh, and then I also, uh, before we get to um, Rachel though, I wanted to also introduce Julie, uh, Julie is the founder of Cat Companions, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to comfort people with disabilities uh, with um, through emotional support cats while providing cats with a loving home. And a big shout out to Julie for helping organize tonight's program and sponsoring it. So all 120 of us who are watching live and the many more that will watch the recording Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Rachel and Julie for being with us tonight. And Julie, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome. And it's great to see so many people on the call or see your names at least. Um, so I, as uh, Robert mentioned, is that I started Cat Companions. <clears throat> Our website is catcompanions.org and, and you can send an email to us. Uh, the organization is new. We just started a year ago, and what we do is help people, uh, seniors and people with disabilities, with finding an emotional support cat and caring for them. So basically, we help people adopt a cat, and then we provide cat education if you'd like it. And then if you have a problem, Rachel will help you <laughs> um, with the problems that you have. So you don't have to show that slide anymore. You don't you want to take it down. Yeah. So um, I thought I would, could just tell you a little bit about adopting a cat in Massachusetts. So I know it's different in other states, but in Massachusetts, there's kind of a couple of ways you can go about adopting a cat. So if you're the kind of person where you want to carefully go about it, you want to look at cats' personalities, you know, very closely that have been maybe fostered and the personality is, is known, you want, you know, a certain age of a cat and so forth, then you might want to use Pet Finder to find a cat. So you would, I recommend going on, clicking at least, as Rachel has said, that they would be two years old um, or older because you're looking for cats to have their personality set. And so you would search for cats that, of that age, you would search in the area that you want, uh, make sure they haven't been on Pet Finder too long and that they um, are not from an out of town organization. Cause we recommend that you go through Massachusetts approved cat shelters. Cause those shelters have been vetted. They know <clears throat> that they have to provide you with the correct information about the cat and have the cat checked by a vet. So once you go through Pet Finder and do this search, um, then you have to read all the descriptions of the cats and see if, you know, what, what cat, if the cat's affectionate or not. Um, you know, you don't want a cat that they say is timid and, and won't come up to you in this case, because in our case, we're trying to place emotional support cats, which are merely friendly cats. So you're looking for a cat that's going to be affectionate and come up to you and and be your be your friend. So um, so you can look on Pet Finder and look for cats. It is a process because healthy, affectionate cats can go really quickly. And this is all looking across shelters that usually have an adoption process where they want you to fill out an application. 
going to take some time because they're volunteers. Um, so they don't get back to you right away and the cat may be gone. So then you might have to look for more cats. Um, if you do have a disability or you're a senior, we can help you go through this process and help you find cats that way. Um, the second way, if you want a cat quickly and you're not too particular about exactly what you want, um, you can go to the Animal Rescue League or MSPCA Angel, and they have various locations. Both of them have a location in Boston. And they have an open adoption process. So they're not gonna ask you all these questions and screen you. They assume that you're a good person who's gonna take a good care of the cat. So you can look on their websites. They do keep their websites up to date constantly. And we recommend that you look at them like the day that they're gonna open for the week in the morning and then see what's there and go in You know, if you see something. Some people just go in and maybe the staff knows something about the cat or a lot of times they don't know anything about the cats because the cats come through so quickly. Sometimes they do, the, the staff have interacted with them or you interact with them and you see that they're the kind of cat that you want. Um, so if you're the kind of person that, you know, it's, you're okay with, you know, hit or miss and, you know, you might go there one day and it's not really gonna work out that day, but you can go a different day, you know, then and that could be a good option for you to, to do the open adoption process through those two shelters. So that's basically how you go about it. And again, um, I can help you, you know, if you have a disability or a senior, you can just go on our website, catcompanions.org and apply, and then we can set up a time to talk. So that's what I have to say about it. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel, if you have anything to add or, if you want to go on to the next topic. So, yeah. So thanks, Julie. And um, so your audience knows I do sit on your board, um, your advisory board, and I do help. So if you are somebody out there who, who needs an emotional support cat or would like a cat who can help, um, you know, with anxiety, chronic anxiety, that type of stuff, I can actually, you know, be right there with you and help with all of the stuff that goes along with adopting a cat. But there is a process, as Julie said, and she really has it down. So definitely connect with her if you need help with that. So having said that, I'm now going to talk about, okay, you have adopted the cat, you signed the dotted line, now what? Um, so the first thing I want to think about is, you know, before we get that cat home, we want to think about gathering all of your supplies. So before you actually have that cat in your door, we have a few things we want to make sure so that there is a happy homecoming for your new cat. So let's go over some of those cat essentials that are so important for your cat's happiness to make sure your cat has everything she needs when she enters her new home. So I always like to highlight first toys because enrichment is so important for a cat. And particularly, you want to think about interactive activity toys. Interactive activity toys are toys where the cat has to do something. The cat is busy. The cat is working to overcome some challenge or figure out a task or make something work or manipulate the toy in some way so that food will be doled out. Um, interactive toys, and a great example of this is puzzle feeders, are really important for your cat for solo play because you're not gonna be able to be with your cat all of the time, of course, when you first bring her home. So you want her busy and engaged and figuring out um, challenges and things that are enticing and appealing. So my favorite type of interactive toy is a puzzle feeder. This is a specific type of toy where the cat has to figure something out or manipulate the toy in some way. And when she gets it right, a little piece of food is doled out. And that's very, um, exciting for a cat because it simulates a hunt and it satisfies a lot of the cat's natural instincts. Um, cats who have opportunities to, you know, do this type of work to accomplish a task or solve a puzzle, um, won't, be, won't be focusing on her own fear and anxiety and stress, which is of course normal when she's brought, been brought into a new home. Um, most cats do have fear when they are you know, brought into a new home, they don't realize yet that they have this lovely home and they've hit the jackpot. So 
they are going to be nervous about being in a strange place. And puzzle feeders really, really help with helping cats overcome that fear and stress. Um, when cats have that ability to hunt and they're successful, they get the food doled out. It does so many positive things for a cat. It makes the cat feel confident. It, it makes the cat have positive associations with her new environment. It releases all those feel-good chemicals in her brain. So puzzle feeders are number one on my list of the type of toy to have for your cat. The other thing we want is hiding places. So you want your cat to be able to hide if she's scared, but you don't want her to hide underneath the bed or underneath the bureau because those are places where you can't really get to your cat and you can't interact with your cat. So if the room that you choose for your cat has a bed or a bureau or other furniture, or other furniture that she could get underneath, block that off. Um, you can use luggage, you can use boxes, you can use storage containers, but not block off the underneath parts of that furniture. But do provide accessible hiding places for your cat. This can be a cat tunnel, a cat cube, um, make good use of all those Amazon boxes you have ha hanging around, boxes are super, um, a box on its side is a great hiding spot. So a lot of newly adopted cats will want to hide under beds or under couches, um, which is normal because they're scared. But the difference with a hiding place such as a cat cube or tunnel or box is they are accessible to you. You can sit next to these hiding places and you don't have to like reach all the way under and be threatening if you want to try to interact with the cat. So, okay, the cat hasn't come home yet. We've gathered our essential supplies. Um, make sure you have that small room where you're gonna put all of these items. And now let's really make sure the space is warm and welcoming for the cat. I call, I like to call the room the sanctuary room. Um, that's my little term for it because it kind of gives your cat a little sanctuary in her new home. So make sure you have food and water in the room. Cats do need constant access to clean water and make sure you change the water daily. I also like to make sure the bowls are um, such that they don't, um, they don't cause what's called whisker fatigue. So bowls that are too narrow or they're particularly deep, the cat's whisper, whiskers will rub against the sides or the edges of those bowls. And it can be uncomfortable for some cats. It causes something called whisker fatigue. So look for bowls that are wide but shallow. That's what's really perfect for a cat. I also like um, stainless steel bowls. Um, stainless steel bowls don't affect the taste of the food. They're durable, they're easy to clean. They don't um, hold in bacteria. I mean, a lot of plastic or ceramic bowls when they get chipped or they have little cracks in them can kind of hold in the bacteria or old food and they start to smell kind of stinky. And often cats don't like those types of, of smells and bowls. So stainless steel is my number one choice. Of course, you want a litter box in the room and litter. Um, I recommend for litter boxes that the box be uncovered. And for litter, I recommend choosing something that has a soft, sandy texture that would simulate what you would find outside and something that doesn't have a lot of additives or perfumey smells added to the litter. A lot of cats won't use litter that has like a scent to it because they want something that resembles what they would find outside. And, you know, the last time I checked, the ground outside isn't scented. So avoid overly perfumey items. Um, you know, you want some cat beds for your cat. They like soft surfaces. You want to make sure you have a scratching post in the room. The scratching post should be at least three feet tall, so your cat gets a full stretch, and it needs to be wrapped with either rope or sisal. We do not want a carpet-covered scratching post for your cat. Um, carpet won't do the job of sloughing off the, de the uh, dead seeds of the nail. It won't condition the claws, and worse, their claws can get entangled in those little loops, and then they won't, use, won't want to use the scratching post again. So three feet tall, rope wrapped or sisal wrapped are your best options. And also in the room, make sure you have vertical space. This can be a cat tree. It can be a window perch. 
You can repurpose an existing bureau or dresser that's in the room with a soft cozy quilt on top of it, but make sure you have some spaces that are elevated for your cat to get up high. Um, they really enjoy surveying their territory from an elevated space. Okay, so we have everything that we need for our perfect sanctuary room. And you always, 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 no matter how confident you think your cat is, you always want to start your cat off in her own small separate room. Um, actually, the smaller is room, the smaller the room is, the better, because cats do feel more safe and secure in small spaces. Um, too much territory too soon will be scary and overwhelming for your cat. So select a nice small sanctuary room that's not too overwhelming and make sure it's cat proofed for your cat's arrival. We don't want any hiding spaces in the room. We want the underneath of um, beds and bureaus blocked off. You wanna make sure there's no like cracks in the walls or hidey holes that a cat could get into. Um, cats have movable collarbones. So if they can get their head into a spot, they can get their whole body into a spot. So really make sure there's not those little um, hidey holes or cracks in the walls that a cat could get into and get stuck behind a wall. Um, I've been I've gone to many homes with the fire department to get cats out of places and walls. So be careful about that. Um, okay, so okay, no cracks blocked off. Okay, said all that. You want the food on one side of the room, um, food and water on one side of the room, litter box on the other side of the room because they don't like to um, go too close. They don't want to um, pee and poop too close to their food. I know these are highly technical terms here. So food, on one, food and water on one side, litter box, scratching post on the other side. And then make sure your toys are kind of sprinkled about the room so she has um, opportunities for solo play when you're not in the room with her. Um, okay, so now we are well, ready to welcome your new cat into your home. So we've chosen the sanctuary room. We've set it up with everything your new cat could possibly need. So now it's time to bring your new cat home. So on that special day, you're gonna bring home your new cat. You're going to go directly with your cat in the carrier to the room that you have set up as your sanctuary room. The cat's in the carrier. You bring the cat into the room. We set the carrier down on the floor, close the door gently behind you, and now open the carrier door. But don't force your cat out. Don't reach in and try to drag her out. Let the cat come out at her own pace. You can take the door off the carrier and you can, or you could even tie the door back with a pipe cleaner or baggy tie. Um, this way your new cat can use her carrier as a place for safety and security. Because right now it's the only item in the room that has her comforting smells and deposits on it. So remember that at, you know for the first few days, the carrier is the only thing in that room that has her familiar smells, has her deposits. So leave it there for her as just a benign object in the room for her to go in and out as she wants to. Now, it's a sanctuary room, but it's not a prison cell. So you can go in there as often as you want to visit. And visitation is encouraged. Go in there as much as you can. Um, and when you do go in, think of being not threatening. So what does that mean? Um, it's really helpful to sit on the floor instead of towering over her. And it's helpful to have um, not to always be focused on her. So at the beginning, just go in and do your own thing. Um, cats find it non-threatening to have something in your hands and then be looking at that item in your hands. So, you know, bring in your iPhone and look at that, check your Facebook, check your social media, write some emails, um, have a book, do your knitting, call some friends, you get the idea. So have something in your hands and be looking at that item in your hands to a cat that is a very non-threatening posture. So that's how you want to start off. Um, go in there as often as you can, be, th be not threatening, use your voice in a soothing tone. You can talk to your cat. She's not gonna understand what you're saying, but she will understand the tone of your voice. So kind of that soothing, 
sing-songy tone that we might use with babies and infants, we can use that same exact tone with our new cats. Um, you can also use a synthetic pheromone product in the sanctuary room. And you can spray that on the door frames or um, pieces of furniture. So synthetic pheromone products are um, a synthetic version of a cat's own feel good deposits. So you know when a cat is in a new place and she's rubbing her chin on um, items in the room or maybe she's even rubbing her chin on you, she's depositing her, her feel good deposits, her smells, her scents, She's marking this as a feel-good territory. This is a place that they've already decided is friendly. It feels nice. I feel good here. So when you use a synthetic pheromone product, you're tricking her into thinking that she's already marked the room as a feel-good, friendly place, and that can help your cat, your new cat, settle in to her new to her new room. Um, so anytime she's in her safe spot, you know she's in her cat cube, she's in her cat tunnel, she's on her cat tree, wherever she may be hiding at the beginning. She's in her carrier. A good thing to do is just sit next to her on the floor, take on that non-threatening posture that I talked about, you know, do work, talk on the phone, update your email, update your social media. Just be near her as often as possible without making any overtures towards her that she may feel um, as threatening. Do your best to always be non-threatening. Eventually, your cat is going to feel comfortable with coming over and investigating you. She may come over and sniff your feet. She might come over and sniff your hand. And when she does this, just act like it's, you know, no big deal. It's nothing earth shattering. If she comes over and sniffs your feet, I know a lot of people get very excited. They want to be like, oh, oh she came over to me. But we don't want to reassure that this is like a big deal. So keep it calm, be cool, be collected, and just sort of acknowledge it with your voice, but don't, don't go crazy that this is like a huge big deal. Um, the more time you can sit on the floor and not be towering over your cat, the better. So if you are able to, sitting on the floor is really the way to go. If you can't sit on the floor, if it's difficult, if you have mobility issues, maybe a low chair or a pillow, but being as low as possible is helpful. So hang out with your cat as much as possible, follow her lead, let the cat set the pace of the interactions. In these matters, it's always best to go at the cat's pace and realize that just like people, every cat enters into a relationship at her own pace. Um, Every, you know, everybody just like us, we are quicker or slower with meeting new people. Um, I'm the type that if I'm at a party and I don't know anybody, I'm perfectly fine to stand in a corner and drink a glass of wine and just observe and maybe not go and meet that many people because I'm shy and, and like groups of people. Meanwhile, my husband, by the end of the party, he's like the mayor and he knows everybody in the whole room and he knows their whole life story. So cats are the same way. Some cats are more timid and they may venture out slowly. Some cats, you know, want to, are brave and they're gonna um, investigate everything right away, but it doesn't mean they're not friendly. It doesn't mean they're not affectionate. They just need to go at their own pace. So, you know, your cat has to adjust and cope with a lot of change and, and that's okay. So just lavish love and attention on your cat with your voice, be there. You know, try to maybe initiate some play sessions. Um, keep earning her trust with routine, with feeding her, with being there, with visiting. Um, so you want to keep your cat in that sanctuary room until she seems comfortable and unafraid. And depending on your cat, this could be a few days. It could be a few weeks. But let the cat set the pace. If you go in there and your cat is still hiding, then she's not ready yet to come out and see the rest of the home. But if she's greeting you at the door, if she's trying to get out, if she's following you when you leave the room, then these are signs that she is getting comfortable to explore the rest of the territory behind that sanctuary room door. So if she does seem ready, um, we can now begin to let your new cat um, 
see her new home because she's feeling confident now in her small territory. So when you do think that she's ready to explore the rest of your new home, we want to do this in incremental stages. Again, too much territory too soon will be overwhelming for your cat. So don't force her, don't force this new cat to try to establish a territory in your entire house all at once. This will be scary, um, it'll be overwhelming, and it, it'll make her revert back to wanting to hide in the sanctuary room. So before you open the door to the sanctuary room, close the doors to some of your other rooms in your house, like close some bedroom doors or um, close some door, like some bathroom doors. And if you have more than one floor, start off with just the floor that the cat is, um, you know, the floor that the sanctuary room is on. So like if it's on the, if your sanctuary room is on the second floor, we'll just start off with that top floor. And you can use a baby gate to help with keeping the cat on one level of your home first. So we're going to calmly open the sanctuary room door and we're going to allow the cat to come out at her own speed. Some cats are brave, other cats are shy, some cats are excited to see and smell everything. Other cats, you know, want to take it one step at a time. So let the cat determine how far she wants to go. And as the cat starts to come out into the main part of the home, you can use a fishing pole or a wand type toy to, you know, distract her or to encourage her to kind of come along. Um, and that will help if she's a little bit nervous or reticent about exploring all this new territory. At the beginning, you really want to keep these out of the sanctuary room sessions short. You don't want the first session to be like, half an hour out of the room, or you don't want to just open the door and be like, okay, this is it. Go go and see the whole house. Start off with just 10 minute sessions. When that's going okay, we can go up to 20 minute sessions. When that's going okay, we can go up to 30 minute sessions and so forth. So keep it structured, keep it incremental, start off short and slowly build up the time. If she seems scared at 10 minutes, you know, don't go to 20 minutes, stay at 10 minutes for a few days. So again, let the cat set the pace, let her determine how fast you know this process goes. If you if you go at the cat's pace and respect, you know, her needs, this it'll go along just fine. So during these roaming sessions, now is the time to figure out where you want your litter box locations to be as well. So you can set up your litter boxes in a couple of areas that you have chosen that you want to be the permanent locations when she's out of the room. This way, you know, during the roaming sessions, your cat can get to know the other areas where the litter boxes will be, and she can figure out, you know, where she feels comfortable going. But at the same time, you're still keeping the litter box that's in the sanctuary room, sanctuary room there, so she has her comfort and safety and security. So leave the box in the sanctuary room set up a few other boxes and some locations that you think might be good. And then, you know, you can see which boxes that she goes to the most and which ones she uses the most. And those will be the ones that could be the permanent locations. I always, always recommend keeping that sanctuary room set up for a while, even after it seems that the new cat has settled into the new home. You want to continue to provide her with a sense of safety, a sense of security, and we want her to know that she has her safe space if she needs it. So by presenting your home to your cat gradually, you will decrease that fear, anxiety, and stress that does come with um, you know, being in a new location. So when we go to set up things like the litter box, we really want to think about what's important to your cat. And Location, location is, of the litter box is probably like one of the most important things to consider when you have a new cat. And this is because cats feel very vulnerable when they are in their litter boxes. Um, they're always concerned about being ambushed by an invader or opponent or another cat. And this is an instinct in a cat and a cat feels this way so this is an instinct, even if she's the only cat in the home, she's gonna want a location where she has a clear visual field. 
She can see all the way around her and that she knows that there is ample potential for escape and what I call ample visual warning time. So a lot of times when people come to me and they're having litter box problems, it's because the box is covered or it's in a location where the cat can't see around her. Like the litter box is, is in a closet or in a cabinet. Now, we think in terms of privacy, because as humans, we want privacy when we're, when we're pooping or peeing. But cats want the opposite. Cats want a clear visual field. They want to see all the way around them. They want to know that if an invader does appear, they are going to be able to escape easily. And they want a lot of warning time, you know, should an invader or opponent appear. So the problem with a covered box is not only does it completely block the cat's visual field, but should an opponent appear, the only means of escape will be right into that opponent's face because there's only one way in or out. So a lot of cats do not like covered boxes and a lot of cats don't like locations where the box is you know, wedged behind something, underneath things, shoved into a corner, um, behind furniture, in the bathroom, behind the toilet. These kinds of locations can cause um, litter box aversion. A lot of people like, you know, bathrooms, um, basements, mud rooms, annexes. They're popular locations for litter boxes for us because they're out of our view, but they're not often um, good locations for cats. Um, for some cats, when the litter box is in the basement, um, that stairway can be a harrowing journey. So really think about having a nice open area that isn't blocked by a wall, isn't wedged into something, behind something, under things. Try to have um, the litter box location at, um, as open as possible. Also, a lot of cats don't love litter boxes in the laundry room. You know, if they're in the box and then somebody in the house takes a shower or flushes the toilet and they hear like that, all those pipe noises and the water rushing, sometimes it really startles them. And some cats who get startled when they're in the box then associate the box with that fear and they won't venture into the box again. So think about all of these things that might cause fear, you know, in your cat when you're thinking about where to set up your litter box. Um, in general, Think about escape, visual warning time, and a clear visual field. You know, I know when we go to the bathroom, we're not thinking about escape, but for a cat, it's very, very important. Now let's make sure we make sure the cat has the ability to scratch without, um, you know, turning your couch into confetti or, you know, scratching up your carpets and your rugs. So what I find is the main reason the posts are not being used are, it's not the right texture or material. The location is not convenient, like it's too far away because people don't want to see the scratching posts as part of their household decor. Um, there are height and weight issues or people redirect, but they don't um, deter at the same time. So like they might put down deterrence but then they don't redirect to the right post or the other way around. So as I said before at the beginning, the post needs to be rope or sisal wrapped. This is the only texture that will condition the cat's claws and the only texture that will really do the job of sloughing off the, the, um, the old sheaths of the claws. So it's really important. Um, things like carpet don't do the job. I like it's too soft and um, it doesn't it doesn't do anything to condition the claws. Um, you also want to make sure that the height that the post is the right height. If it's too short, I see so many stores that sell these scratching posts that are so short, they're like a foot tall or two feet tall. Your cat won't, your cat does not want to like crunch over like this to use the scratching post. They want to reach up and get a full stretch when they use the scratching post. So you want it to be at least three feet tall. I also see a lot of these very skinny scratching posts or these posts with these teeny tiny bases. If the post is at all 
wobbly, if it's not sturdy, if it doesn't withstand that pulling and pushing, again, the cat is not going to use it. Think about what the cat would scratch on if your cat was outside. The cat would scratch on trees. Trees are pretty darn sturdy. So you wanna think about that when you're choosing your scratching post. You don't want something that wobbles. I mean, if that post wobbles or worse if it falls, you, I'll, I'll guarantee you your cat will never use the scratching post again. So tall enough, sturdy, doesn't wobble, um, the right texture, rope or sisal, and location. Um, you know, don't put the post somewhere that, you know, the cat has to go like an in, on an indoor hike to get to a scratching post. He's just gonna resort to using what's ever closest. And this is when cats start to use, you know, your furniture or the backs of sofas and so forth. Okay. Um, oh, I also want to mention this too. In terms of having the post be really high, be really tall, there is an emotional component to scratching. So it's not just about their claws. You know, when they get that full stretch, it releases um, stress, tension, and anxiety. They release the, the tension in their back muscles. And, and they also mark. So, um, Cats, you know, mark in many ways with scent depositing. Some cats are marked by peeing, which we want to avoid. But cats also mark with the scent glands in their paw pads. So having a nice, tall scratching post where they can really reach up and get that full stretch also um, satisfies that emotional component that is very, very important um, to a cat. Now, some cats prefer horizontal scratching. So if you do have a cat and she's not using the post, but she's scratching on the floor, this is a cat who might prefer a scratching pad rather than a scratching post. And the last thing I want to talk about before I start taking questions is play. So for a cat to be happy and well-adjusted, she needs opportunities to hunt, stalk, kill, capture, and eat what she caught. So when you play with your cat, which is a solo toy, and you throw the toy on the floor, that's not really play. But if you take a wand toy and just sort of like move it around, do, 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 that's not really so satisfying to your cat either. So you really want to, when you play with your cat, you want to simulate a hunt. You want to use a fishing pole or wand type toy, because this way you can really manipulate the toy to mimic prey and to simulate a hunt. So when you use a fishing pole type toy, you can really pretend that, that you know, you're prey. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Sometimes you scurry around. Sometimes you go and you hide behind furniture. Sometimes you run underneath things. So really think about mimicking how real prey would act. One thing prey will not do is go and dangle itself wildly in front of the cat's face. I see a lot of people do that as a way to get the cat's attention, but that usually doesn't work because that won't trigger your cat's prey drive because it's not realistic. Real prey runs away from the cat, not towards the cat. So think about mimicking prey, move the toy about in an unpredictable manner, and play with your cat for about 10 to 15 minutes. Because when your cat is hunting in real life, that's about the length of a typical hunting session. Now, when you're ready for the session to come to an end, don't just say, oh, it's been about 10 minutes, time for the session to end. No, we want to simulate a successful hunt. So here is the important part. Slowly wind down the action. Okay, the prey is getting tired. The prey has gotten injured. The prey is dying. And let your cat have one last final juicy capture. Let your cat sink her teeth into that toy. Let your cat sink her claws into that toy. And then follow this immediately with food. When cats are hunting, they expect to be able to eat their caught and killed prey. Cats expect to be able to eat their captures. So it's really important to follow the play session with a little bit of food. It can be a treat. It can be a portion of the cat's meal. It doesn't have to be a lot. 
but you always want to end the play session with food. Play should simulate a hunt, and the whole point of the hunt is to capture and eat the prey. So you always want to sim um, end these sessions with food, and when you do this, your cat is going to feel proud. She's a successful hunter. She is the queen of her territory. It releases all of those feel-good chemicals. It boosts confidence. Um, it creates positive associations with her new home. All of this happens with you at the helm because you're manipulating the fishing pole toy. So all of these associations that are positive are with you too. So it's really one of the most powerful ways to create a cat human bond. And this is why the laser pointer is not a good way to play with your cat. Um, she's pointlessly chasing that little red dot that can never be captured. It's very frustrating. It's not simulating a hunt because she, ne she can never get it. She can never capture it. So it leaves the cat very frustrated and very tense, um, which is the exact opposite of really what you want to do when you're playing with your cat. So I do not recommend using a laser pointer to play at all. I wish um, pet supply stores did not sell them as cat toys um, because they they leave the cat, it's an unwinnable game for your cat. And it leaves her very frustrated and wondering why all of her great hunting techniques are no, lo no longer working. So we don't wanna do that to our cats. And um, with that, I am. I want to thank you guys very much for um, tuning in, and I'm ready to answer all of your cat behavior questions now. Thanks. So, folks, let's give Rachel a big virtual round of applause for a great talk. And uh, as Rachel said, now is the time. So, if you have any comments, type them into the chat. If you have any questions, type them into the Q and A, and we'll address as many as we can. All right. So. Carol says, I have spent a fortune on interactive cat toys. The only one that has engaged my cat more than once uh, is a teaser pole with a feather and bell at the end. Can you recommend any other interactive cat toys that work? Yes. Yeah, so um, puzzle feeders are the way to go, because as I said, the most important thing is to simulate that hunt. You know, when a cat just uses a toy and there's no point to it, she doesn't get to have that capture in food. It's basically to a cat, it's pointless. So those are okay for like extra sessions, but that shouldn't be the, the cat's main outlet. So I recommend puzzle feeders. Um, Kong is a company that makes fantastic selection of puzzle feeders. Um, there's a um, the pet safe, Exerciser is a great puzzle feeder, but if you want to reach out to me, I have a whole list of um, puzzle feeders that I do recommend. And in terms of the wand toy, in order to um, entice your cat to use it, the one you were talking about with the feather at the end, again, the thing that turns a toy into something boring and repetitive and, and pointless into something that's enticing and appealing and satisfying is that Mimic, mimic, mimicking a hunt and having that final capture and food at the end. So if you're not consistently ending your play sessions with food, the cat will become bored because to the cat, it is pointless. Uh, we have a few folks asking about biting. Uh, Carol asks, how can I get my cat to stop biting? I think she's only playing, but she gets ferocious and will attack two or three times, and the bites hurt. They do hurt. So, okay. So most cats, um, so if your cat's only form of stimulation and opportunity to sink her teeth into something is your ankles as you walk by or your arm as you're moving, you're, that's what your cat's going to do. So to me, this sounds like a cat who, again, needs more interactive play with the opportunity to get those captures, to sink um, her teeth into something and to end with that final capture and food. Again, we want, we want your cat to hunt and stalk and pounce. This is natural cat behavior. We just don't want her to hunt and stalk and pounce your skin. So we need to redirect to appropriate means of play. Now, when you're doing the play sessions, 
and you're using that fishing pole type toy, allow your cat to have many interim captures. So like during the game, um, let her get the toy and let her sink her teeth into it. Let her sink her claws into it and stop moving the toy. You know, pretend that the that the prey is playing dead or the prey is um, tired. The prey has lost its stamina. So during the play session, you can let your cat have multiple captures so your cat can sink his teeth into something. And when he sees the toy isn't moving, he'll loosen his grip or loosen his teeth and you can start the game up. So every time that you have like these little mini interim captures, your cat's brain is releasing all of these feel-good chemicals, which feels great to a cat and is so much better and so much rewarding than going after your skin. So conduct a play session that resembles a hunt. Um, in a real hunt, you know, the prey would get tired, the prey would lose its stamina, the prey would play dead to elude the cat. And every time he gets his opportunity to sink his teeth into something, he's feeling good. And again, wind the game down, um, the prey dies, final capture food. So your cat's prey drive is getting triggered by, by you. And because he's not getting enough active stimulation that mimics a hunt, that's what's happening with the biting. So if we give him plenty of normal opportunities to bite appropriately, he's not going to feel compelled to um, go after you. We can also use um, play to distract and redirect. So let's say, excuse me, let's say that you know the situations that he bites or he's already in motion. Um, we can distract and redirect. So whip out your fishing pole type toy, distract your cat with you know a toy. I, I recommend for this a toy called the cat dancer toy. Um, they're, they're very, very tiny. It's basically a piece of wire. And the reason I recommend it is they can be curled up to a very small, small, small little thing like this big. So they can be stashed anywhere, like between um, under a, a cushion of the couch or between pillows or basically anywhere. It's a teeny tiny toy. So you can have a whole bunch of them in your home because when you distract and direct, you don't want to be running around your house to find out where your toys are. So distract your cat. You, you think your cat's going to bite. You Maybe you just, you think, you have an idea. Err on the side of caution. Be preemptive. So you think your cat's going to bite. Distract your cat with the toy. When you distract the cat with the toy, you now trigger his prey drive and you shift your cat out of that aggressive mode that's negative into the positive mode of a hunter. So now we shift him to the toy. He's feeling positive and now quickly engaged in a little impromptu interactive play session. Provide him with multiple captures, wind the game down after about five minutes with a final capture and food. He gets to sink his teeth into something. Your cat gets to release his anxiety and tension. Your skin remains safe. Everybody wins. And if you want more about you know, how to do the play and how to do distract and re redirect, I have all kinds of information on that, so just let me know. Uh, lots of folks asking about food. Uh, Nikki says, uh, what dry food brand do you suggest? Uh, we've tried so many. Our cat likes them, but they cause occasional problems with nausea, vomit, or abdominal pain. So I recommend, I use um, on my cats who have sensitive stomachs, the Hills brand, and I use the um, ID and the ZD. So it's I slash D and Z slash D, and the brand is Hills. I found it to be like the, the most... Um, The, the best food for cats who like get nauseous or have stomach issues. And uh, Osmena asks, do you recommend hand feeding cats at least for the first few weeks? Um, I would, um, you could do that. You might want to put the food like on a, a spoon or a, um, like a wooden um, tongue depressor type thing, just to make sure there's, um, enough space between the cat's teeth and your flesh. 
because you never want to teach your cat that it's okay to, to bite into your skin, even if, if it's inadvertent. Excellent. Uh, Carol would like to know, how can I get my cat to start using a scratching post? So first we want to start off by making sure you have the right post. So we want it's three feet tall, at least three feet tall, rope or sisal wrapped, sturdy, you know, nice and wide, not too skinny, um, and and the location. So it should be somewhere where you you guys tend to hang out a lot because that's where the cat is going to want to scratch. Um, if the cat is already scratching, say let's say your cat is, is scratching the couch. So I suggest to people that you deter and redirect at the same time. So a lot of people will set up deterrents like, you know, sticky products or um, things that smell badly or things that feel badly to the cat, but they don't redirect at the same time. So let's say it's the couch. So we want to put like um, double-sided tape or there's a product called Sticky Paws. Um, there are all kinds of products that are made, made to deter your cat. In general, think slick or sticky. Those are textures that cats do not like. So use, up, use a deterrent that's slick or sticky. But then what you want to do is place the scratching post right by the couch where the cat is inappropriately scratching. So the cat comes up to scratch the couch like he usually does. Do -do 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 -do. I'm going up to the couch, which is really inappropriate, but I like to scratch it. And then when it gets there, he sees that the surface is no longer appealing or enticing because it's covered with sticky stuff or slick stuff. But look what we have here. Here is the perfect scratching surface right here, right next to the couch. It's tall enough. It's the right texture. Um, maybe it's covered in catnip to entice me to use it. So you really want that post right there. So when you deter, there's that other appealing alternative right next to the couch. And I have a whole video and program on scratching if you know you want to get in touch with me. Uh, we also have folks asking about uh, jumping. Their cats are jumping on the sofa and the countertops and the island and the bathroom sink. Uh, si similar situation there. Uh, how, how would you combat that? Well, if it's the counters, I mean, a lot of cats do like elevation. Um, if it's the counters, you want to figure out why the cat is going up there. So is it going up there for safety? Is it going up there because he enjoys the elevation? Is it going up there because he smells, you know, the food and the aromas? This is all different reasons for this and all um, different ways we might work on solving that problem. But one thing you can do is, again, deter the cat and make the counter, um, which was appealing, make it no longer appealing. And again, we can do that with products that are slick or sticky and then redirect to another elevated place like a, a cat tree. It's really helpful if your cat tree or elevated spaces are higher than the counter because that's, that will make it more enticing. But, you know, it's first a matter of figuring, figuring out why the cat is going up there in the first place. And then we can figure out how to handle that problem. So that might be something somebody wants to reach out to me about. Uh, but yeah, to... deterring and redirecting yeah. and using play and redirecting to something positive will always work. Uh, we talked a bit about eating. Let's talk about drinking. Diane says, I've always had cats that want to drink from the dripping faucets. What do you think about cat water fountains? And then we have a similar question. Nikki asks, what brand of cat fountain do you recommend there's such a big variety uh, of filters and fountains. Yeah, um, I have a cat fountain myself for one of my cats who does love that moving water. Um, a lot of cats, you know, it's an instinct for a cat to want to drink from moving water because they perceive it as being, um, you know, more safe and not, you know, stagnant water tends to have more bacteria and like microorganisms in it. And sometimes it gets that film. So a lot of cats do prefer moving water. So I have a cat like that myself and I have a fountain for her that is um, motion activated. So it only turns on when she's within a certain radius of the, of the fountain and it works out great. I can't think offhand of what the brand is. So if that person wants to email me, I can 
recommend it, but it's very easy to take care of. I tried a lot of them before I settled on this one. Um, so I can let you know. Yeah, I put Rachel and Julie's email addresses in the chat and I'll be putting their websites in the chat uh, momentarily. Uh, so Melanie asks, we have a three-year-old cat. What are your thoughts about bringing in another cat or kitten into the home? So bringing in another cat when you already have a cat, how does that work? Okay, well, I have a whole program <laughs> that I can send you the video or you can find it on my website of how to introduce a um, newcomer cat to a resident cat because it's a whole process. You never want to just plop you know, a new cat into your resident cat's territory. Um, territory is very important to a cat. And when a cat feels like her territory is up for grabs, she will not accept that other cat. So you really want to go through the process. And I'm happy to help you with that with my video. It's, it's very self-explanatory and I go through it step by step. Um, having said that, you know, it's always helpful to go to a shelter where they, they know the cats in this particular situation, because then you can match personality. So if you have a cat who is you know, very, very assertive and confident, you don't want to bring home a cat who's like very shy and timid. And if you have a cat who's, um, you know, shy, you don't want to bring in a cat who's like a dominant alpha cat. So you want to consider the personality of your cat and then match that with the personality of the new cat. But you have to go through the introduction process no matter what. I do, I mean, if you have a three-year-old cat, your cat hasn't gone through social maturity yet. So um, a lot of times I recommend to people to adopt a cat over the age of four, because once they, um, after age four, their personalities are set. And so what you see is what you get, because it is common that um, cats can change. You know, think of people as we go through adolescence and our personalities really change a lot. But then when we're, when we're old, um, you know, we're, we're more set in stone. So if you get a cat who's older, you know, that personality isn't going to change. But your cat is very young, so you probably could go ahead and get um, a kitten or a young cat and be okay with that. So I, folks, I did want to acknowledge we just passed eight o'clock. Uh, Rachel and I game planned beforehand, figuring we wouldn't get to all the questions uh, within the hour. Plus I babbled for the first five minutes. Uh, so we're gonna go till 8.15. So it is completely socially acceptable if you need to log off in the next 10 minutes and go start watching your sports or your movies or your TV or go to bed or whatever you do. Uh, but we're gonna go until 8.15, okay? We're gonna try to answer as many of these questions as we can. Uh, so Sheila asked, and, and as a reminder, we are recording and you'll all receive the recording tomorrow. All right, so Sheila asks, uh, we recently adopted two seven-year-old cat brothers, but we don't particularly like their names. Is there any problem with changing their names? That is a really great question because so many people, yeah, you know, the shelters just give them a name and they try to keep it interesting. Yes, you can absolutely change your cat's names. And really all you need to do is when you're next to the cat, just say the name as much as possible. And eventually they will associate that, you know, those sounds and syllables with, with them and they will respond to their name. So say you want to change the cat's name to Max, you know, every time you're feeding Max, you know, here's your food, Max, good boy, Max, you know, have some water, Max, use the, use the name a lot. And they will eventually realize that those syllables have to do with them. Um, especially when you do something pleasurable with the cat. So when you're petting the cat, feeding the cat, playing the cat, playing with the cat, those are good times to repeat the, the, the desired name over and over again. But yeah, perfectly fine. So David asks, do you have any suggestions or resources on traveling with a cat? Yes. So actually, um, that's a topic. So every year there's a, um, a gigantic webinar called Online Behavior Day. And this year, um, one of my topics is traveling with a cat in the car and traveling with um, a cat in an RV. So um, there's all kinds of processes to get a cat used to both. 
again, it would be something incremental. You know, you're not going to just like jump in the car with the cat and go across the country. First, you have to get the cat used to the carrier. And then you want to get the cat used to the motion of the car and so forth. So, you know, you might want to start, first start off getting the cat used to being in a carrier. Um, you know, maybe do some little trips just walking around the house with the cat in the carrier. Then you'll go to the car. Then you'll take some short trips. Um, it's something where you do a little bit at a time and get the cat used to it before you go ahead and, and take the whole trip. So yeah, there's there, there are definitely ways that you can successfully travel with your cat as long as you go step by step and get your cat used to the process. So Margaret wants to know, how can you determine why your cat is meowing? <laughs> um, you probably can't, but cats meow for a few different reasons. Um, well, if the cat is older, a lot of cats will start meowing a lot because they're losing their hearing. Um, if the cat wants more stimulation, they may be meowing to get your attention. If, the, if it's a multi-cat household, often cats will meow to locate the other cats in the home. Um, but typically cats mostly meow to us. So it might be a little bit of trial and error. You know, maybe the cat is hungry. Maybe the cat more, needs more active stimulation. You could try adding more um, interactive play the way I described with the fishing pole toy, making sure that cat gets that final capture and food. Um, you know, a great thing too about if cats who are revved up and meow a lot, when you do use that interactive play, you tap into your cat's natural hunt, eat, sleep cycle. So after you do interactive play and with the final capture and food, the cat is content and relaxed and will take a nap. And a napping cat is a cat who's not walking around meowing all the time. Mary says, my new cats are about six years old. They are extremely nervous. One of them scratches a lot and her fur falls out in clumps. Could that be caused by nervousness? Yeah, this is a cat who probably has some type form of chronic anxiety. I mean, I like to try, you know, natural methods first. So I would add in the interactive play the way I'm talking about, because it does boost confidence, releases those feel good chemicals in the brain, creates positive associations, makes the cat feel, you know, in charge, the ruler of her territory, you know, monitoring her territory and standing her ground. All of these things that might cause a cat to be anxious, you can solve with that interactive play um, with a fishing pole toy. But, um, you, you know, you could talk to your veterinarian about um, chronic anxiety medication or a calming treat that's over the counter options and you know this a pharmacological approach as well so many questions so so difficult to determine which ones to ask um you know you, you touched on this a little bit but let me let me ask it again uh this is a little more broad uh so how do you introduce a new cat to your home how do you choose the cat that's right for you how do you age match? Uh, personality can be deceptive versus how they act in a shelter versus how they're going to act in your home. So can you just speak sort of in general to how to how to choose the right cat for your situation? Yeah. So whenever you whenever you bring a new cat into your home, you must 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 start that cat off in her own small room, which I call the sanctuary room. So the cat must start off there. Um, you want to make sure the cat is introduced, you know, to you and is feeling okay with you and is bonding with you before you introduce that cat to the resident cat. The resident cat should always have free reign of her home. Always. It's her home. It's her territory. She was there first. So you have to be very careful with keeping the newcomer cat, you know, in her sanctuary room and letting the resident cat adjust before you move forward. And then there is a whole process with, with scent swapping, with soil swapping, with um, using the doors open a crack to have like some food association work where 
they do something positive, you know, eating. Food is often motivating for a cat in view of each other. Then you start opening the door a little bit wider and you might add in some play. You know, then we go to a baby gate phase. So there's a whole very structured process for bringing a new cat into the home. In terms of choosing the right cat, you know, like I said, I usually tell people to talk to the shelter staff because yes, when you go to visit the cat, you may not see the real personality, but the shelter staff who are there and are working with the cat and are with the cat when it's not like the visiting hours and there's not a lot of people there do know what the, you know, or usually will know what the cat is like. And they'll know at least if the cat is okay with other cats and things like that. So it's always good to go to a shelter where um, there's a physical building and they and they are they really know their cats well, or they have a foster program where again, you know, the the cats are are, are known to them very well. Um, you know, some sometimes the cats do come in and out very quickly, but often, um, you know, in, in a lot of shelters, there is a process where the cats come in, they need to be vetted. So most times they do get to know the cats. I um, you know, with ages, if you have a cat who's over four, then I suggest, um, you know, looking for a cat who has already gone through social maturity. And that occurs between the ages of two and four, because then at that point, what you see is what you get and is not going to change. Uh, we'll take a few more questions. I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Uh, Al says, I have my cat for six years now. And uh, ever since she was a little kitten, she's very affectionate. She loves getting close to our feet and asking us to pet her with our feet instead of our hands. Is that strange? And then Heidi asks, do you have any suggestions on helping to get a cat used to human touch? Our new kitty is aversive to touch, but enjoys sitting beside us. Okay, so the feet one, you know, what can I say? Whatever floats your boat, right? I mean, we're all different too in our preferences and there's ways I like to be touched or don't like to be touched. And there's always an outlier, right? Like there's a generality of what, you know, we might like, same with our cats, but there's always a cat who likes something else. If that's fine with your cat, you know, and the cat enjoys it, it's fine. Um, in terms of getting a cat used to touch, what I suggest is something called a petting wand. So what a petting wand is, is a long wand or stick or um, ruler or yardstick. And what you do is you put something soft at one end. So like, say you take have this ruler and I put like um, a soft like children's mitten or some cut up strips of a t-shirt, something fuzzy, something fleecy, something very, very soft. And I pet the cat with that rather than my hand. So many cats are what's called hand shy. For whatever reason, they haven't gotten used to human hands and they may not accept touch with your hand, but they will accept touch with a petting wand. It puts a safe distance between your hand and the cat, use the wand to pet the cat. Start off like in some places that the cats tend to accept easier, like the top of the head, the back of the neck, and use the petting wand to pet the cat rather than your hand. You know, some cats just haven't gotten used to human hands or they may be hand shy because of in a prior situation, maybe they were abused or, you know, some just find it scary at first, I mean, Think of like an octopus-like thing coming to you. You might be afraid at first too. So um, use a petting wand if you need more instruction around that. Again, just let me know. A couple more questions. Uh, H.A. says, my older daughter wants to take our new cat on her exercise walks. We got a pet stroller. Do you have any tips on this process? You know, again, you want to start um, very, very gradually. So you don't want to just take a cat and bring it outside for like a half an hour walk. You want to get the cat used to the idea very, very gradually and incrementally. So you might want to first start off just having the cat, you know, in the stroller and in the home, you know, have her be inside in the stroller, just 
in there. Um, you might want to leave it out in the room a lot so it, she gets used to it as a benign object and not something that's afraid. Um, leave it there, maybe put some treats around it so she's encouraged to go over and explore it. Um, go on a short trip just in your house with the stroller before you go outside. So just think of breaking things down step by step by step. Um, you never want to go from zero to 60 with cat. So I would start off just having it be in the room, then maybe putting some treats around it so she goes up and in it, maybe letting her, you know, get into the spot where she'd be to take some trips around the house, then maybe just a short trip, like down your walk and back, you know, build up very slowly. Don't go on to the next step until the cat is handling the, the current step fine. All right, we're gonna give uh, one last question. It's gonna go to Carol. She writes, uh, we rescued a bonded pair the female had some trauma before getting to us. Uh, she's skittish. We need to be able to transport them. The female is almost impossible to get into the carrier. We have only had success a couple of times. These times of success took place when she was sleeping or napping. We have tried putting meds in her food, but she will not eat them. She's too smart. How can we get her in a carrier every time we need to? All right, so there's two ways to do it. One is, again, we go through a process where she gets desensitized to the carrier. So you can leave the carrier out in your living room all the time. So it just becomes known to your cat as a benign um, object in the room or perhaps even a napping spot. You can put a cozy quilt in there. You could throw treats in there and encourage her to go in. Um, if she does go in, you can close the door and just walk around the house and then bring her back. So you can slowly build up her tolerance to the carrier. Now, no, I'm saying tolerance, not gleefully embrace. So we just want to get to the idea that she'll be okay with going into the carrier. Um, and I have a whole program for that. So if they want to reach out to me, they can. The other thing that I do, I have a cat who turns to Cujo when it's time to go into the carrier. And um, I use gabapentin for her. And giving it to her before, she's like a marshmallow. I just pick her up and put her in. And this is a cat who would rip my face off if she wasn't on the gabapentin. Now, yes, they if you try to mix any medication and food, usually it doesn't work. Cats have a very, very strong sense of smell. What I do is I get the, the medication compounded into a treat. Um, I use chicken flavor treats, but you can get the the um, the medication compound into pretty much any flavor that you would like. You put it on the floor and the cat eats it. So I would suggest rather than taking the medication and trying to hide it in food, which rarely works, to get the um, have your veterinarian send the um, prescription to a veterinary compounder and get it um, into a treat so you can just feed it to your cat. Excellent. So uh, Rachel and Julie, I think we're going to leave it there, but I did want to give you an opportunity uh, at the end. Do you have any last words for the audience? Anything you want to, any parting words or anything you wanted to plug or anything like that? I would just say, you know, if I didn't get to your question, I know Robert put um, my website and information in the chat. So just feel free to reach out, you know, give me some time because there's a lot of you and one of me. So a lot of questions are going to come in at once, but I will answer every single question that comes my way. And you can also go to our website, catcompanions.org for help with adoption, you know, questions as well. Excellent. Thank you. So folks, let's give Rachel and Julie a big virtual round of applause one last time. Uh, look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, our upcoming virtual program lineup, and uh, as I did in the chat, I'll also include uh, Julie and Rachel's email addresses and website addresses. So uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. And um, I uh, look forward to next time. So thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much, Julie. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Bye -bye.